I want to talk about boldness today. I want to talk about Holy Ghost courage and boldness because this is what will be required for us to do what God has called us to do in these last days. I don't know how many of you have not heard of Andrew Womack. Anybody? You don't know who Andrew Womack is? Nobody. Praise God. So you might have heard him share how he was in a conference in Oklahoma City. And he stood there in that conference. It was filled, you know, thousands of people. And God spoke to him and he said, there are many young people that are present here in this conference that will one day tell of all the wonderful miracles, signs and wonders that happens in this great awakening. And Andrew asked the Lord, he said, Lord, so are you saying that this great awakening is coming soon? And God answered, he said, no, it is not coming soon. It has already begun. Amen. And I can vouch for that. I can vouch that I have seen an increase in anointing. I have seen the heat go a little higher to the point. I mean, it, it, and, and it is no, you know, it is not to give me because it has nothing to do with me, but it has everything to do with God's willingness to heal, to touch people's heart and lives. And it's happened, it started to happen to me that I would go and meet somebody you know, like one time I was actually at, at, in Orlando at the end of a GTS and I wasn't ministering. But then there was a young woman that was working for the ministry that was pulling stuff, you know, carrying boxes. And she saw my husband and I and she wanted to introduce herself to me. And so she came to me and she said, hey, I want to meet you. And I went and I gave her a big old bear hug. Unknowingly to me, she had back problem from the top to the bottom where she was in, in, in sharp pain. Instantly, she got healed. I knew nothing about it. Just a few weeks ago, I was in Colorado, and I'm in a restaurant getting ready to have, you know, dinner. And there were some ladies in the restaurant that saw me, Audrey Mack! So I went to them, and I just started to talk to them. They were at the table, and I put my hand on the, the, the shoulder of a lady and just talked to them, just, you know, how they were doing, what they were doing, if they were enjoying, you know, Colorado. And, and then a few days later, I received an email from them saying that that lady had some type of an incurable disease that the doctor didn't know what to do, and she got instantly healed there. That is what I'm looking for. That's what I'm, I believe that's what, you know, it started to happen like that. And my heart is like, I want to see more. I want to step into a higher level, you know. And I'm, 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 I'm contending and pressing in because I know we have entered into something. But it takes us to position ourselves, not only with what we do, but with our heart to pursue, to contend, to expect, to vision, to see something. But it also will require courage. And in the Bible, hallelujah, in, in the Bible, it says in Daniel 11, 32, it says, those who know their God shall be mighty. Anybody who wants to be mighty? shall be mighty and do exploits. Now listen to this. The word mighty in Hebrew is the word shazak. It means of good courage. It means to take courage, to be self encourage, establish, steadfast, even obstinate. God is calling us to be courageous, self-encouraged, so that we don't need somebody to constantly tap us on the shoulder and like, are you feeling good? Come on. No, no, no. We can be courageous, self-encouraged, established in that courage, steadfast in that courage, and obstinate in that courage. That's the kind of people that can do exploits in God. Wait, don't you disqualify yourself that quickly. I'm not finished. 
An exploit in Greek or in, in Hebrew, excuse me, means deeds marked by daring courage and excellence. God is looking for such that will be even obstinate in that courage and faith. Self-encouraged, steadfast in that courage. So they can do mighty exploits marked by daring courage and excellence. I love it. Winston Churchill. You rem how many of you have heard of him? In the face of the Nazi movement. Where England, you, I mean, if Winston Churchill had not been there, I would be speaking German, not French. And you might not even be speaking English, but German. And Winston Churchill, in the face of the most impossible war, that everybody was like, oh, you just have to negotiate with Hitler, you could not negotiate with a, 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 a cobra or with a snake. You cannot negotiate with the devil. And he saw that and he, he, he went and he was courageous, daring, self-encouraged at times when they wanted to shut him down and obstinate in his courage. And listen to what he said. Courage is rightly esteemed the first of human qualities, because it is the quality which guarantees all others. That quality of courage, what I want to talk about today is the quality that will guarantee the power of God, the exploits of God, the daring exploits of God. The anointing, the healing, the miracle, the signs and the wonders. That is the quality that you and I need to possess in these last days. That daring courage, that self-encouraged courage. If that is even a, a concept. Oh, glory to God. Because you know the Bible says in Ephesians 3.10, it says to the intent... That now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. God said it in, in such a way that you put the devil back in his place. God is not going to do it. We are. Or I would say God in us is going to put all the principality, the domination, the spirit of Antichrist that is moving and, 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 and creeping in and starting to dominate. Now, I am French. I come from a socialist nation. And I have seen what socialism will do to a nation. When I started in France, socialism was not there yet. You know the concept of take from the rich to give to the poor? That's not in the Bible. And when I grew up in France, we had churches in every corner and people on Sunday, on Sunday, everything was shut down. There was a fear of God, an honor of God. Sunday would shut down. It was like ghost town everywhere. And people went, even though it was a Catholic church, people went to church. And then what happened? Some people got into power with an agenda of socialism. And what it did through the last 35 years, it's turned a nation that had some sense of God and fearing God. It turned it into an atheist nation. Now there is less than 1% in France that believe in God or that have a you know, walk with God or go to church or are born again, I should say. Less than 1%. And how did that happen? Through socialism. Why? Because so I don't know why I'm taking a rabbit trail, but it's okay, I don't care. Socialism, the agenda says, uh-uh, 
We'll pay for your, for your free education. We'll pray. We'll pay for your health care. Oh, you don't want to work? Don't worry. We'll pay for you to stay at home and not work. And what does this create? And oh, we'll take from the rich and give it to those who refuse to work. What does this create? It creates a people who all of a sudden do not need God. Why should I work? I get paid by the government. Why would I believe God for a good job or believe God for healing or believe God for this or that? After all, the government will do it all for me. And what does it create? A people that become independent from God, who no longer need God. And it says, it's, 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 it happens, you know, like, like boiling a frog in cold water. It's subtle. It's little by little. It's progressive. But one day you wake up, you no longer need God, and all of a sudden your heart is cold towards God. Because you never, you are no longer helpless with that God. Your help doesn't come from God. It comes from... And let me say something. How we vote is so important. How we vote and who we put in places of government will dictate if one day your kids will fear God or not. Okay, let's move right along. But... I remember when I left France, I remember growing up where everybody had to look the same. You don't, don't you dare try to be different. You know, it was always, you were part of the pack. And if you had an idea and you said, how about this? Or how about that? And they would say, ah, it's not being done, so don't even try. And then when I came and God, I got saved. And then God told me to pack my bags and come to the United States. I obeyed. I just went. I, and I remember the first day I landed in Dallas, Fort Worth. I remember feeling like I was breathing freedom. Wow. I cannot explain it. It was not just, oh, I'm in the land of the free. I, I could, it's like my lungs, I could feel, I felt like, like a weight got off my shoulder and I feel like I could breathe freedom. I could dare to be you know, dare to dream, dare to see, dare to do the impossible. There was a freedom. There was a spirit of excellence. There was something different about the very atmosphere in the United States. And today I grieve. Today I'm so grieved because I see that being taken from us, where there is no longer freedom, where they are shutting down churches, I never thought I saw the day where pastors would be put in prison because they dare open their church or they dare preaching the gospel. In America, I saw it in Vietnam, I saw it in India, I saw it in, 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 in Myanmar, I saw it around the world, in, in Russia. I never thought I'd see that in the United States in these days. I'm talking just a few weeks ago. I love what Thomas Jefferson said, a government that can give you everything, it's a government that will take everything from you. I don't know how I got into that. I don't know how I got into that, but anyway, there is a righteous anger in me, a courage that says, I've got to tell what I've seen, what I know. So we're talking about us, the church, being courageous because it's that courage, it's that boldness to see truth, to speak truth, to stand on the truth that guarantees, like Winston Churchill said, that will guarantee everything else, which in this case is the power of God, the exploits, the signs and wonder and miracles. In order to see that in our lives, we have got to be people of courage. You know, that reminds me, 
When I, 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 I lived, I, re, I remember one time on my first year anniversary with my husband, I took him to France. We did a little tour and, 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 and I remember we were also on the auto, no, let me back up. I don't want to lie. That, I was by myself because I was in Germany. Go back. <laughs> so I was with a group of people on the Autobahn in Germany. And in Germany on the Autobahn, which is the highway, there is no speed limit. Don't you be thinking about moving to Germany? <laughs> but you like all of a sudden there is like, you know, you can go as fast as you want. But here is the thing, all of a sudden when you go so fast, you almost feel like you're out of control. You no longer have control over your car, you know. And that's how it must feel with God. When you come to the point where you, the big eye is out of control and God has all control. You know, like my food is to do the will of the Father. It's not about what you want to do, how you want to do it, where you want to do it, but it's allowing God to tell you what to do, where to go, how to do it. And you all of a sudden, you are almost out of control. And it sounds kind of weird to say that. Amen. But it requires of us, all of a sudden, to use, to choose, to abandon ourselves completely to God and trust him. So when he tells us to do something, though it might feel uncomfortable, though it might feel scary, though it might feel almost dangerous, though it might feel almost crazy, that you trust God enough, but you said, okay, I feel like I'm out of control. Okay, God, you're in control. I'm going to trust you. And you go. And that's the quality of courage that has to be in us of total abandonment in God by faith that will guarantee us to start seeing those exploits. And you see, we see that. We see that all through the Bible. For example, Gideon. You remember Gideon? Here is Gideon in Judges chapter 6. I love that. Gideon in, 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 in Judges chapter 6. God appeared to Gideon beating wheat in a wine press. Now right there, let me do a little parenthesis. How odd to be beating wheat in a wine press. But there is a prophetic picture there of this last day awakening. Because wheat speaks of bread, which speaks of the word. And the wine press speaks of wine, which speaks of the Holy Spirit. So a major key of this last awakening is that it's going to be from people filled with courage, but people that are filled with courage that know the word, stand on the word, and flow with the Holy Spirit. And that, re that reminds me what Smith Wigglesworth saw on his last days. In 1947, he had an open vision, or God showed him the last day, the last revival, or I would say the la latest great awakening. And he saw it, and God spoke to him and said, you're not going to be part in it, or of it. It is for the last generation before the coming of the Lord. He said, and he said, all through the time, there's been different revival. There's been the healing revival. Then there's been the faith revival. Then there's been the charismatic revival. And there's been, he said, but the last revival will be a revival of the word and the spirit when they come together. Because you see, as I travel, I see some people, they're all about the word. I mean, they can talk the word. I mean, they know everything that they can expound on the word, uh, uh, explain the word. They know all about the word. But they don't really believe much on the Holy Spirit. Or they don't really know how to, to go with the Spirit of God. Or then you have those that are all about the Holy Spirit, the prophetic, the signs, the wonder, the... <laughs> <laughs> but then they kind of get a little like, you try to teach them the word and they go, boring. 
No, it's not either or, it's got to be the two. We've got to be people that walk on the word, founded, established on the word. Like Jesus said, you know, a, a, a house whose foundation in the word. Glory to God, so that when the wind of the spirit come, you're not going to blow off. And be flaky. And yeah, that's good. I just got it. I'm, I was thinking that's pretty good. And that's what happened to people. You see, they don't have the word. They're not founded and rooted in the word. And then there is a move of the spirit and they go, oh, God knows where. But it's going to be the people of the word and the spirit together that will be part of this last revival. And then we find out that in Judge 6.13, Gideon, he asked, he said, Hey, why has this happened to us? And why don't you, we see any miracles? Sounds familiar? We've come in a generation. It's almost like there is a generation that's kept where we have not seen the mighty miracle that they saw in the 40s. You know what I'm talking about? With the William Branham and the Jack Coe and the Kenneth Hagin and the Old Roberts. We heard about it, but we're like, okay, then why don't we see any miracles? You say God is powerful. God, why haven't we seen anything? Why is not anything? You know, and what did God respond? Have I not sent you? <laughs> what is he saying? The reason why we're not seeing any miracle is because you're sitting on your little tush and you're not going where I told you to go and do what I told you to do. Okay, I'm going to preach on the wall there. Oh, glory to God. God says, you go. Have I not sent you? Sounds familiar? Mark 16, Matthew 28. Go ye, go tell it on the mountain. Go and tell it. We haven't gone and tell it. <laughs> Thank you for loving me. But the moment Gideon got up, believed, and said, okay, I haven't seen anything. I don't know much of anything, but you tell you tell me to go, I'm going to go. And the moment he did, you know the first thing God told him to do? To tear down the altars of Baal. Okay, before you shout a little too longer, wait. <laughs> do you know what they were? The idols of Molech, the idols of Baal, you know what they required as sacrifices? The people were to sacrifice their babies on the altars. Sounds familiar? When Moses came as the deliverer, the first thing the Pharaoh did, he had, you know, kill the babies. When Jesus appeared on the scene, the first thing they did, they killed the babies. Jesus is getting ready to come back. What are they doing? Killing our babies. It's called abortion. Oh, no, no, wait. It's called women's freedom. No, it's called abortion, which is called idolatry, which is called not going where God is going. You know, we're talking about Oh, we are in the generation, we are the Enochs of this generation. Before the judgment came, before the tribulation came, in Genesis 6, in Genesis 5, Enoch walked with God and he was no more for he was taken away. We are now approaching the time where Jesus is going to come back. And we're going to come back with him. To rule and reign and put the devil completely, throw him and bound him. But before that happens, I believe there is the Enoch, the Enoch generation that is walking with God. And Amos 3 3 says, How can two walk together unless they be agree? And let me tell you something. 
what you do, what you say, how you vote has everything to do or how you are working with God. If you are voting for people that promote abortion, that facilitate homosexuality, LGBTQ and every other letter in the book, you are not walking in agreement with God and you are not walking with God. How can two walk together unless they be agreed? Promoting death, promoting idolatry, immorality is not walking with God. And you might say, well, but I don't do it. I don't do that. I don't do abortion. I don't do homosexual. I don't do that. But voting for somebody who does it, somebody who promotes it, somebody who facilitates it, in the Bible, it's like doing it. Do you remember? Do you remember Balaam? Balaam, who could not curse Israel. He couldn't. He tried. He couldn't. But what did he say? What did he do? He kind of indirectly, in a backhanded kind of way, showed them how to get it done, to be defeated. And when you promote and vote for people who have such agenda, in a backhanded way, you are doing it. Okay, let me just go on this side over there. But it, we've got, we are at a place at a time where we've got to have eyes opened and realize what we are doing. Why? Because we, if we're going to be the Enoch, we've got like Enoch, walk with God. And to walk with God, we've got to agree with God. We've got to be people of life, people of truth, people of holiness, people of righteousness. We've got to walk with God. I'm not saying we are perfect. But as far as we know, consciously, I'm going to walk with God. If God says this is good, I'm going to say this is good. If God says this is evil, I'm going to say this is evil. If God says don't do that, I'm not going to do that. To the best of my ability and my knowledge, I'm going to walk in the light that is in front of me. Kusha <laughs> kataramane We've got to be people of truth. So that's the first thing. Imagine Gideon in an ungodly land where there were altars of Baal and Molech everywhere. And God says, hey, there was even an altar in his father's backyard. And God said, that's the first thing you're going to do. And yeah, I, I, I have to admit, he waited he did it at night. But lest we throw a stone at him, he did it. And it was a test, I believe, from God to see if he had enough courage to do what was not easy, what was fearful, what was not practical, what was unpopular, what was dangerous. And he passed the test. And right after that, God started to send him to pick up his army. And out of thousands of people, only 300 were picked out because there were people that were willing to go with him to tear down the altars of Baal and Molech. There were those that were not afraid that went and, and they were filled with faith. And there were those who were watchful. You remember the test? Go and bow down and drink. And God says, those who just go like this, and lap like a dog. Next. They were eliminated. Why? And he said, those that just have one knee that are watchful and prayerful, but take the water and bring it to their mouth and watch around to see what's going on. These, this is your army. And that's who God picked out to help Gideon to do those mighty exploits. And he brought revival in the land. He tore down the, the, the ungodly way. He was a simple guy. But all of us, when you choose to do, to be bold, to be courageous in the face of the ungodliness, in the face of what was happening, with that one act of courage, something happened. And he changed the whole generation. 
did mighty exploits. Glory to God. And I love that it says in Judge 6.34. I have a tall and tall other message about that. In Judges 6.34, it says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. We, we have that impression that the Spirit of God came upon him. That is not what the Hebrew actually means. I looked at it, it was like it, something got quickened in my spirit. I knew God wanted me to dig. So I went and started to dig, and I, and I discovered what it actually means. He says, God put Gideon like a garment or like a glove. Where all of a sudden now, God just went. And if you allow me to say this way, Gideon became God-possessed. God put Gideon like a glove so that wherever God wanted to go, Gideon went. Whatever God wanted to do, Gideon did. They became one. Why? It started with an act of courage saying, I don't care what people think. I don't care what they're going to do. I don't care what the consequences. I don't care if I become unpopular. I don't care if they defriend me and friend me and whatever on social media. I don't care if my church kicked me out. Not this church. I don't care. I'm going to do what you say. And a daring act of courage opened the path. To the power of God, the signs, wonders, and miracles. So that's who we have to be. You see that in the early church, don't we? I mean, here is Peter. I mean, that got intimidated by a little young servant. Are you not one of those guys from Galilee? I saw you with that guy, Jesus. No, me. I don't know him. Who are you talking about? Oh, you're talking about some? No, not me. We know the story, denied Jesus three times. But then all of a sudden, filled with the Holy Spirit, he became that courageous, non-intimidated kind of guy. He stood in front of the, the crowd, thousands on the day of Pentecost. And there were Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians, a religious system of the day, and lots of people. And he stood with courage. And you know what he said? Yeah, you're the one. You voted to have Jesus crucified. You killed him. Sounds familiar? That's what I was talking about. They told him. I mean, the, the Jews did not crucify Jesus. The Roman did. But as far as God was concerned, because they cast that vote to have him crucified, Peter said, hey, you crucified him. He was bold all of a sudden. And 2,000 came to the Lord. Thank you, Jadik. Yeah, that's why I hired you, to encourage me. If nobody else does, my assistant will. Glory to God. But we see, but listen to what Peter said. In Acts chapter 14, verse 3, he said, Therefore they stayed there for a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But you see, we see here, they were walking in great signs, in great wonders, in miracles. Why? Because they spoke with all boldness. They were not afraid of the consequence. Of course, we know what happened. There was consequences. Because they got put in jail, beat up, intimidated, saying, don't you dare speaking in that name. And they said, well, tell us who, uh, who should we obey? You or God? Huh. And they had courage. And they spoke boldly the word which they knew was, had consequences. They didn't have that fear of man. They did not love their life even unto death. Sounds like something that Paul said, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of his suffering, which was persecution. Not loving my own life even unto death. And we know what happened. They got beat, intimidated, put in jail, forbidden to speak in the name again. In other words, keep your mouth shut. 
stop sharing what you know, stop doing what you do. And they responded with great courage. And they said, huh, tell us who should we obey, you or, or God? And then in verse 19, verse 8 and 11, so they went, and he went, Paul, in the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning, persuading, concerning the things of the kingdom of God. And now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. Here again, why is it that Paul saw so many signs and wonders, so many miracles? Why? Because he understood that he had to be courageous in the face of persecution, in the face of opposition, in the face of intimidation, in the face of those that try to be politically correct. It is no coincidence that in this age that we live in, in this time that we live in, we are facing the same spirit of Antichrist. Don't you be speaking about anything in the church. Be sweet, quiet, do your little gospel. Don't say anything else. That intimidating spirit called politically correctness. Or yet, you should not offend anybody. What? You don't want to offend. You don't want to tell the truth and offend people. Really? And why is it that Paul... That Peter and John and Jesus, they were not afraid. They were not ashamed to speak the truth. Because they knew and had understood that it is the truth and only the truth that will set people free. Not the love of God. Today, the new, the new trend is, and listen to me, I understand the love of God. I've been set free. I understand the love of God how much God loves me even when I mess up. But it's not the love of God that's going to set us free. It is the truth that we know, the truth that we live, the truth that we declare, the truth that we practice. You shall know the truth, intimately know the truth, and that truth will set you free. It doesn't say you shall know the love and the love will set you free. No, love will cast that fear. Love will cast that fear when you have to speak the truth and all of a sudden you feel intimidated. I cannot speak the truth because if I speak the truth, at that moment, you got to know that God loves you no matter what. He is for you, not against you. That God's got to have your back. At that moment, that love, that love will cast out the fear so you can stand and speak the truth. There is something that Andrew says. He says, if your wood doesn't catch on fire, what does he say exactly? <laughs> your wood is wet. Some of you, you need a little gasoline on your wood. Maybe that's why I'm here. I don't know. But you understand what the Bible, I didn't say it. The Bible said it. Now, what is boldness? Contrary to what some people, I'm not in the business of wanting to offend everybody and anybody. I have the fear of God in me. And I want to walk in love, in kindness, in gentleness, in self-control. But I also know that God is calling us to be bold. Not arrogant, not harsh, not unwise not rude, no. Boldness doesn't mean that we are arrogant. Have you seen people that try to be bold? They're arrogant. They brash, they're harsh, they're unkind. That's, what, that's not what I'm talking about. You can be very kind. Actually, when you are very loving, it takes the love of God to speak the truth to somebody a truth which you know they need to hear. You know, I've got my sisters. They don't know God like, and I don't mean that in a very arty way. They all live in the system that is just deceiving people. And they think they know God, but I know they don't. But it takes courage for me sometimes when I have them on the phone to speak 
by the leading of the spirit, not unwisely, brashly, arrogantly. I don't. But I try to find that place of kindness and love that loves them enough to want to see them set free, to see them entering into an intimate relationship with a God who loved them. And it takes forgetting about myself. It takes forgetting about ourselves, what they think, how they're going to perceive us. Are they going to still want a relationship with us? It takes that kind of selflessness to love somebody enough and says, I'm going to love you enough to tell you what you don't want to hear because I know that's what you need to hear to be set free. It takes the true love. It's the love that says no greater love as the one who gives his life for another. That's the giving of our life to tell somebody what they don't want to hear because they don't know any better. It's silent in this Catholic church this morning. Now, why do I say that? I grew up in a Catholic church. It's not disrespectful, but I remember as a kid, we would walk in the Catholic church. It was like, and I would think, are we going to wake up God? As a kid, I thought, why do we whisper? Why do I tippy toe? I just felt like, why? I could not understand until I grew up. I knew. But that's, I, 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 I talk like that because it makes me laugh, and I just like to laugh. But you see what I'm saying? It takes that kind of love to be bold, to speak boldness. And boldness is not arrogance. Like I say, it's not rudeness or harshness. You can be kind and gracious, kind and truthful. And so here is what boldness, it's freedom in speech, frankness, free and fearless confidence. It's cheerful courage and assurance. It is not being afraid, in another word, of what people are going to think or say. That sounds, you know, to me like Jesus. You know, this morning I was looking for that verse where it talks about Jesus that the religious people confronted him and says, we know, oh, master, you have no fear of me. And I went to, I'm like, if there is somebody who is going to know a verse, it's going to be Javan. So I went to Javan. I said, Javan, where is that verse? I cannot, I know it, but I don't know where it's at. And he, we went and bim, 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 in no time, we found out. So you want to know what that verse is? In Matthew 28, verse 16, only three people, the rest is okay. <laughs> Matthew 28, verse 16, he says, The Pharisee sent him some of their disciples and some members of Herod's party. They said, Rabbi, we know that you tell the truth and really teach what God's way is. It's in the complete Jewish Bible. You are not concerned with what other people think about you since you pay no attention to a person's status. You know, it's when there is a person of greater status than you that you know that your situation depends on how they like you, accept you, and yet you still choose to tell what you believe? That's what I'm talking about. It happened to me not long ago where I had to tell somebody who is a friend, but it's somebody of very great influence that could make me or break me just like that in the ministry I, I speak. And yet, I was like, you know, if I don't dare telling him what I really believe about this and what is my stand on this, then I have nothing to do in the ministry. You know what I mean? And so that's what it's talking about for us to be people that are not afraid of men. What they will say, what they will do, whether they will like us, whether they will accept us, whether they will penalize us, whether they will reject us, whether they will persecute us. Because you know what Proverbs says. In Proverbs 29 verse 25, it says, the fear of man is a trap. And I'm talking here, again, remember, courage equals signs and wonders and miracles. If we want to see the signs and wonders and miracles that God is wanting to do through us, 
we're going to have to be people of courage, which means we choose not to be intimidated by the fear of men, not to fall into the fear of men. And I learned this lesson a long time ago. I remember I was just brand new in the Lord. And I don't often share this story. But I was just brand new. I just got saved, just packed my back into the U.S., and I ended up in a Bible college, in a Bible school. And here I remember in the Bible school, there was a lady in a wheelchair. She had arthritis, probably fibromyalgia. I mean, she was stuck in a wheelchair. She couldn't walk. She couldn't move. And my heart went out to her, and I was like, oh, my gosh, I want. And I was like, Lord, can you heal her? Please heal her. And I was really, my heart went to her without ever thinking that maybe I could have something to do with it, you know. I was thinking, God, can you heal her? And then one night I had a dream. And in the dream, I saw myself reaching to her, and I saw her getting out and being healed. So I got really excited. I'm like, Lord, you're going to heal her. Praise God. I saw her come out of the wheelchair. And then I got excited. And that day was Sunday. On Sunday night, I'm in church, worshiping God and praising God. And all of a sudden, I had an open vision. And in the open vision, I saw her come out of the wheelchair. But I was the one praying for her coming out of the wheelchair. And I went, God, I mean, you want me to pray for her? And so the next day, Monday morning, I go to Bible school. And I see her on the front there of the auditorium, so I take her. I say, let's just go to the back of the auditorium, away from the curious eyes. And so I went there, and as I started to pray for her, all of a sudden, I've never experienced that ever again. But I will. Amen. The Shekinah glory fell. It was like a, a cloud that came over us. To the point where all of a sudden, the tangible presence of God was there. And everything disappeared around me. All I could see was her and I. And so at that moment, I prayed for her. And I said, come on. You know, come out of the wheelchair. But I didn't know a whole lot. I didn't know what I know now. Today, I would have gone and pulled her out of the wheelchair. Boldly, fearlessly. But I, I didn't know. I just thought, well, if it's from God, it's all going to happen like that. And I said, come on, come on. And all of a sudden, she's like, I'm trying, I'm trying. And all of a sudden, a thought crossed my mind. Yeah. Oh. The cross. And what are people going to think and say if she doesn't get healed? And what is going to happen if you fail? And at that moment, I took a step back. And I thought, oh, yeah. And shoo, the glory left it, the anointing left, and all that all was left was her and I in the whole auditorium. And I felt so disappointed. It was like one, it's like such a letdown where I felt for so many years that God did not, he, that God let me down. I had the, I mean, I stepped up and stepped out, but God, I did my part. You didn't do your part. And I felt like God had let me down. I even went to somebody and said, you know, explain the situation. Nobody could give me an answer until I grew with God and I got to know God and I got to walk with God and I realized that it was not God who let me down. It was me who let him down. The fear of man got in. And the fear of man will cut the power faster than anything. And once I realize to do those mighty exploits, I've got to have that courage that is not afraid of what people think, what people will say, what people will do. All I'm concerned about God, pleasing God, loving God, obeying God, walking with God, expressing God, being daring to do things to get out of the comfort zone and not thinking so much about myself. And once I understood that, I said, to see those mighty exploits, those signs and wonders and those miracles, we've got to have those people who wants to, the mighty people that are filled with courage and boldness, not afraid to speak. Go and tell it. Not afraid to step out of the comfort zone. Not afraid to do what is not popular or what is not, you know, easy. What it, well, you know, not afraid of any of that, but willing to step up and step out into that unknown, into that uncomfortable place. 
You know what I'm talking about? And I love, now Peter. You remember the Peter that got persecuted, that was forbidden to speak in the name of Jesus? And Acts 4, verse 18 through 20, so they, they were called and commanded not to speak at all, nor to teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more or that God you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and which we have heard. And in the verse 33, a few verses later, and it says, and with great power, the apostle gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord. And great grace was upon them all. And you know, the grace has multifacets. It can be the uncon unconditional love, but it's also the power of God to do what is not humanly possible. It's the power of God to do what you cannot do on your own. That's the grace of God. They were not afraid to speak. They were bold. They were courageous. Glory to God. And they say, God, give us that with more boldness we may go out to preach by stretching out your hand to heal. Do you see her again? Boldness and power. Boldness and signs and wonder. Boldness and courage. Amen. And God's miracles. They go hand in hand. You take, you see, most people, what do they pray for more power? God, give us power. God, give us more anointing. No, no, no. What we need is more courage. Amen. What we need is more boldness. What we need is to get free of the fear of man. We get free of the fear of men. We ask God, and th that's what the disciples did. I mean, they got beat up, wept. They came back and rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. Glory to God. And then they came back after being beat up. They said, God, give us more boldness. Hello. Thank you for that clap, sir. Hallelujah. <laughs> Can you imagine? They were already bold. They stood up against the Pharisees, the very one that had beat up and crucified Jesus. They were bold. Then they got beat up, forbidden to speak. They came back with a skip in their steps. Lord, we were counting worthy. Hallelujah. God, give us more boldness. Why? Because they knew that the key to more power was, the, was more boldness. More boldness if we want more power. We don't pray, beg, and ask God, give us more power. God, sprinkle your godly dust. Give us more anointing. No, no. What well, we need to pray, God, get me set free from the fear of men. Show my heart. God, please expose my heart that if there is any fear of men, any fear where I try to protect myself, my reputation, my little me and my house, and I, if there is anything like that in me, just expose it, Father. It takes humility to say, Lord, expose my heart to see if there is anything that is not pleasing. And give me more boldness. Get me set free from the fear of men. Expose my heart. Show me and give me boldness. You see, they didn't say, God, give us more power. No, they say, give us more. Yeah, more boldness. Because with the boldness and the courage... You can do mighty exploits. With the boldness and the courage, you can flow into that uncomfortable place, in that risky place, in that place of the unknown, in that place of the uncomfortable. And it's in that place, which is called faith, that, uh, uh, that all of a sudden, pff, the power flows. You know, for me, the greatest miracle that I have seen is when all of a sudden I chose to die to self, where I chose, it doesn't matter what I look like. I might look like a stupid woman, but it doesn't matter. When I was willing to die to the self, the reputation, or the what if, and I stepped out into that unknown place called risk, in that unknown place called uncomfortable, in that unknown place called faith, 
that all of a sudden, the power flow, and it was not by any strength of mine, but any effort of mine. All it required was my courage and my boldness. I remember I was in India, and I was ministering in a Bible school about healing. And at the end, you know, they ask for people who needed healing. I asked, I said, if you need healing, come. Golly, half of the school came. There was like 200 and plus people that came to the front. So, of course, I didn't have time to take time for every one of them and have a little counseling session with every one of them. So I went and laid my hands and I said, be healed, be healed. And then all of a sudden I came to that place where there was a young guy. He had glasses that were so thick. It looked like, you know, Coke bottle. His eyes were like, bitty, bitty, bitty. And I just go and put my hands on him and I say, be healed. And then I go to the next and I just hear, go back to that young man and spit in his eyes. I thought, Lord, it is rude in America it's ruder in India. And I know some of the stuff, they don't care. They can very quickly have you taken by the collar and kick you out and beat you up outside. If you, if you want to see some persecution, go to India. They'll burn your house in a split. So I'm like, Lord, are you sure? And, you know, but I, I learned something. You hear from God. And it looks like it's spontaneous. It's outside of, it's not an analytical. It's not intellect. It's not something you thought about and something you conjured up and something you calculated. No, it is completely spontaneous out of your norm, out of your realm. It just spontaneous. It flows like Jesus rivers. The voice of God is like water. It flows. Spontaneous. That's a pearl. You might want to. Meditate on it. And I just heard that and I went, I know I wouldn't do that. I don't spit on people. So I, 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 but the funny thing, after you hear from God, you immediately hear the devil comes trying to talk you out of it. Trying to reason things out, saying, but what are big people going to think? And what are people going to say? And what if? Da, da, da. And then I, I just heard the devil say, uh, at the moment I didn't know, first he was the devil. He said, who do you think you are? You think you're trying to act like Jesus. And all of a sudden I felt like intimidated, like sheepish, like, am I trying to be somebody I'm not? Oh, yeah. And then all of a sudden I woke up, I'm like, wait a second, that's the whole point. I want to be like Jesus. <laughs> so I stepped up, I went to the guy, got his glasses, put them in his hand, and poof, I spit in him, on him. What happened? Nothing. How did I feel? That small. So I gave him the glasses back, and I went to the next. But that afternoon, I came back in the afternoon class. That young man came to me with that glasses completely healed. I did not even recognize it. Another time, I'm doing a conference, a pastor's conference in India. And the lady come at the beginning, the first day of the conference. A lady come, young woman with a big old belly. And I'm thinking, oh, she's pregnant. And she's coming, but her face was in torment. And she comes, she takes my hand. And with some kind of an Indian growl, she just put my hands on her stomach. And she went, mm, I don't, I don't talk. and I could not understand what she said. But all of a sudden, I had that thought, spontaneous thought that came. Kick her in the stomach. And I went, oh, Lord, really? She's pregnant. You know what that means, kicking in the stomach of a pregnant woman? This is crazy. But I knew better, you see? I knew that that was not Audrey Mack. And I knew it took risk. It took me putting myself on the line. Well, first it kind of helped a little bit because I knew I was not in the US. So I knew they would not file a lawsuit against me. That makes you a little bolder, let's be honest. And I went, I mean, with all my gusto. Pow! And I stuck her in the stomach. What happened? Nothing. 
And I'm like, okay, well, at least I did what I, and, but the funny thing is when I hit her in the stomach, have you ever seen those cartoons where people's eyes, you know, the, 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 the character is eyes, yeah, it goes, no, 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 no. <laughs> when I punched her in the stomach, all of a sudden it looked like her eyes got out of the socket, coming to bite me. And I went a step back and I went, okay, I'm dealing with a demon, okay. But two days later, I'm back at the end of the conference and we're taking testimonies. And that lady came back. We didn't see the whole conference at the beginning and the end. She came at the end and testified that she had like a stomach cancer. She was on the last stage and in so much pain that she said, if I don't get healed in that conference, I'll kill myself. Because doctors couldn't do anything for her and she was in too much pain. And she was instantly healed. You see, if I had told myself, now am I talking about being completely foolish and crazy? Well, sometimes it does look a little crazy. But when you know your God, when you know the voice of God, and though you might make a few little errors here and there along the way, but God is merciful and God will speak to you, to train you and say, you see, that was my voice. Well, that was not my voice. You know, and as you walk, like you recognize the voice and you dare trust in God and do a mighty ape exploit out of your comfort zone in that place of the unknown and risk. And that's when you start seeing signs and wonders. That's the element that we, if we want to see those signs and wonders, we want to see those miracles, we want to see those unusual miracles then that's going to require of us to go face to face with God and say, God, you're going to have to expose my heart. And if there is any fear of man in my heart, then show me and, 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 and help me how to be totally free from that. And then, Lord, train me on how to hear your voice, to recognize that spontaneous flow of the Spirit so I can hear and dare obey and dare step out. And, and give me, Lord, that courage, that boldness, that I may be willing to step out, out of my comfort zone. Now, having said this, having said this, and I know I think I'm kind of gone over, I just not saw the time. And those pastors, they're so gracious, you would think that they would have gone. They didn't. And here I'm going. Glory to God. Thank you, God. But I'm stopping. But you see, where was I at? What was I saying last? Hmm? Go face to face with, thank you, sister. To go face to face with God, just to find out, to expose your heart to see if you have fear of man, to be free from that. And then to ask God for boldness. So I want to close with a prayer this morning. And I'm so sorry that I just kind of kept you a little longer than I expected. Because I still want to pray for Javan and Dora. But, you know, I feel that it would be unjust this morning for me, you know. And, and honestly, some of the miracles and the healing that I've seen in my ministry, like I said, is by continually asking God to, to give me that courage, to get me free from the fear of man, and to allow me to step out of my comfort zone, and just to be dead to reputation and dead to what people are going to say and think. I'm not saying that I have arrived, but like Andrew says, I, I know I have left because I'm conscious of it and I'm contending for it. So if you're here this morning and you said, I want to see I want to be smack part. I want to be in the center of that great awakening. I want to be one of those. I don't want to be on the sideline. I don't want to be benched. I want to be right in the game. I want, you know, and the, the, the game is not going to happen here in church. The, that time is over. No, I'm not saying church is over. But that great awakening is going to happen like the great awakenings that happened, you know, First and second great awakening, it happened out, outside, where people all of a sudden would be, you know, 
aware of the presence of God, who will be healed in some of the most unusual place. And it will take all of us that want to be mighty to do great exploits, like the Gideon, like the Peter, like the John. Amen. To be able to do those exploits. So if you're here this morning and you said, I want that, then stand up. No, hold, hold on. <laughs> Stay where you are. Warning, warning. Do not fall into the fear of men. What do I mean by that? God looks at the heart. If your heart is not yet ready for that, it's okay. Nobody's going to kick you out, condemn you. No, it's okay. What God looks is at the heart. And if your heart, because your actions and your heart have to match, if your heart is not yet ready for that, stay seated and nobody's going to judge you or kick you out. You know what I mean? What is more important is that we appear real, honest, authentic before God. And if we are at that point, be honest enough to say, you know what? I'm not there yet. That you can ask God to move upon your heart, to help you to want, to do a work in you by the Spirit, to get you to that place where you want to engage. You know what I mean? We've got to be real and honest and authentic with God. You know what I mean? But if you hear and you said, yes, I want to be part. I want to do great and mighty exploits. So, Lord, I give you license and permission to expose my heart. I give you, Lord, I want, ask you to give me great boldness. So I just pray over you right now. Put your hand on your heart. And I'm going to pray a prayer over you. Father God, you see these people, precious people of God, that are heard and now they're engaging their will, willing, Father God, to say, Lord, I want to do mighty exploits. I want to be a Gideon. I want to be a, 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 a Peter. I want to be a John. So, Lord, Whatever it takes, I ask you, Lord, teach me, show me. Father, I just pray for a mighty work of the Spirit in their heart to all bring us all in that place of yieldedness, in that place of death to self, me included, where we completely die to self to give our life for another enough to, to go and tell the truth. To go and do what is not easy and comfortable, sometimes even looks dangerous. And Father, I just pray that you would give us great courage and great boldness to do the work of God. To step out of the comfort zone. To step out of the easy place. To step out on the unfamiliar and the uncomfortable, even the dangerous. Lord, I thank you. Holy Spirit, like Peter said, give us more boldness that we may speak at your word with all boldness. Glory to God. By stretching out your hand to heal. You notice God will stretch out his hand when we step out in boldness. So Lord, I pray this prayer over these precious people this morning. They are my sisters. They are my brothers. They are those, Father, I thank you. I thank you. And I bless them in Jesus' mighty name. You may be seated. And if you're here this morning and you said, you know, I didn't stand up, but I would like to want. I'm not there yet, but I want God to give me the want to. And if you are honest enough that you said, you know, I don't have it yet. I'm not there yet, but I'd like to. Would you raise up your hand? If you're like, God, give me the want. Father, I just pray right now. Thank you for being honest. Oh man, that pleases God. And I just pray for my precious sisters and brothers. And I pray, Father, that you would do such a mighty work in their heart that they would be confronted with the truth, that they would see their need of you. That you would see what they would be missing out. Open their eyes. Open their heart. Give them that sense 
Father God, of, of destiny, that sense of, of your love, your goodness, your grace. Holy Spirit, do a mighty work starting now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Pastor. Hallelujah. Hello, Jemaine and Dora, y'all come on up here. Audrey oh, wants shit, to shit, pray shit, for y'all. Wasn't that awesome? Shit, shit, shit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Y'all stretch your hands out here, if you would, to Jemaine and Dora. Holy Spirit, we thank you. Thank you, Father God, that the time has come. You have been faithful. You have been faithful oh faithful faithful in the in the shadow you've been faithful in the shadow you've been faithful in the unknown you've been faithful and God is bringing you into great light where your work your faithfulness your integrity your love will be seen by many and as I was there glory to God and I was uh, just worshiping God I just I just heard in my heart, just get ready, get ready, because you're going to have your own TV show. Get ready, because you're going to be seen by thousands and millions. And your name will become a household name. Your name will become known with mighty and powerful and daring. And I see you, you will be like an armor bearer. But remember what I spoke to you before. You will have your own place. You'll not just be behind as an armor bearer only, but you will be one alongside. You will not just watch over the ministry and watch over Javan in the spirit, discerning and knowing and seeing and, 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 and praying, but you will also have that place alongside to speak out and see ministry with women, ministry with young women, ministry. And I see you with a TV show even together together on the uh, uh, on the set i see you ministering alongside oh chitele brave kechede i see you with a big building where all of a sudden the building will be too small haha inele mando lo bro stendi atare i kitele vene nondo so lo put your seat belt on and let God take control because now it's going to go from 10 miles an hour to 200 miles an hour. <laughs> Hallelujah. There's been a desire in your heart to move in greater power, in greater miracle signs and wonders. You've seen a little bit here, a little bit there. Hallelujah. But now I'm saying it's going to be everywhere. Hallelujah. And you know those, those miracles I spoke, unusual miracles. Unu the kind of miracle that you have to stop and say, what was that? How was it possible? It is out of the box. It is out of the realm of, of what we've seen, of what we've experienced. Unusual. Never seen, never known before. Hallelujah. But yes, Lord, I thank you that it will take great courage. Because I see you both like lambs. Hallelujah. But inside of you, there is the Lion of Judah. And you're going to know how to walk in both. Both lion and both lamb. Lion and lamb. Lion and lamb. And you will come in some places where people will see as a, a lamb. But all of a sudden, out of a surprise, out of the, the corner of their eyes, they will see the lion coming out. Oh, glory to God. And there will be there those that see you as a lion. And yes, there will be those that will try to enter into competition because they will see the anointing and the favor that is upon you and there will be those like Paul said you preach the gospel uh, you preach with a, 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 a clear heart but there will be those that will preach the gospel out of selfish ambition oh glory to God father I thank you that those will be only now Mandela you will find some of those on your path 
Lord, those that all of a sudden walk into that envy, selfish ambition, comparison, and jealousy. Glory be to But in that moment, you will be like a lamb. You will be like a lamb. Hallelujah. Undelema know that by your love, by your humility, and by your kindness, you will put down the voices of those. And they will be confronted with your kindness and with your love and with your humility. And we will we'll disarm them. Those who would even plot to do things to bring reproach or to kill a vene man or to bring a, a, a reproach and 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 the kale man and no condele brasto. But God says by your humility, by the voice of the Lamb, you'll put the, those those voices and those people to silence. Your love will paralyze them. Your gentleness, your kindness, and your humility will brought that voice, and they 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 cut a leve de bandole, and they influence to nothing. It will disarm them in the spirit. So I pray a blessing over them, and I send them in the name of Jesus. I send them with the word, like they sent Paul and Barnabas. Glory to God for the work to whom the Lord has sent them. And I see now it is beginning. Now it is beginning in another level, in another impact. And Father, I just thank you. Mm -mm, you will be amazing to see the favor, the blessings that will be poured over you and to you. Like I said, some will be jealous of that favor. Some will be jealous uh, of that place, how fast you rise. But do not be, do not fall into that. Do not fall, but just be the lamb. Be the lamb. Be the lamb. So, Father, I just thank you. We send them in the name of Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Blessings be unto you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you. That was wonderful. Amen. I believe every word of it. There was a very strong anointing on here, uh, up here, that I could hardly stand up. Uh, but I'm telling you right now, you know, prayer ministers, y'all come on down. We're going to do a, a quick, quick prayer. But you know what? Before we do, did you enjoy Audrey? Oh, my gosh. Hallelujah. Let's give it up for Audrey. That was amazing. Absolutely amazing. You know, so before we, before we do the altar call, we're going to, we, let's bless her. You know, let's bless her with the best. This is the last guest speaker of the year. Let's give it all up, man. You know what? You give to a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. And you don't, you don't give to get, but yet God does it anyway. He blesses your socks off. Every time you give, he gives back to you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. So with whatever you decide, what measure you use, it says with what measure you give out, it is given back. Good measure, breast down, shaking the other, running over. We've talked about this before. You don't want to give a thimbleful. A thimbleful running over doesn't mean a whole lot. But a dump truck full running over means a whole lot. And I'm going to tell you what, that's the best way for you to go out this year. Let's sow our very best to such an amazing woman of God who travels all over the world. And you know what? Everywhere she goes, your seed is going with her. Do you hear what I'm saying? Everywhere she goes, your seed is going with her. She can't do it by herself. Nor does she want to do it by herself. But I'm telling you what, you sow a seed into that ministry. And every time she spits in somebody's eyes and they get healed, you reap a reward. Every time she kicks somebody in the stomach, every time she raises the dead. It's coming over and over. Commonplace for you. Raising the dead is commonplace for you. In the name of Jesus. You've raised the dead before? One time. Oh, that's nothing compared to what's about to happen for you. Everywhere you go, you watch it, Audrey, and see it. come. I know that was from the Lord. Raising from the dead power. 
So then when those people that were raised from the dead come up to you and say, you sowed seed into Audrey's ministry, and I'm here because of it. Thank you so much. I'm telling you what, y'all. Let's do it. Let's do what Solid Rock does best. And let's give. Let's give. Because what's coming back to you is exceedingly abundantly above anything you could ask or think. Many of you will never go to these parts of the world where she not only has already been, but she's going to be going again. That was awesome today. And I encourage you to go and eat fast here in a little bit and get back here for the, the service at 2 o'clock, healing service at 2 o'clock. I'm telling you what, the, there is such a powerful testimony in her own healing. Powerful. She didn't have time to tell all of it. But I'm telling you right now, you start sewing into this and you watch what's going to happen in your body, in your family, in your finances, in your own ministries. We're all called to the ministry of reconciliation, every one of us. Every one of us. And there's many of you. Where's Lydia? Is Lydia in here? Oh, there she is. Lydia, wave at everybody. There are many of you that are supposed to be going with Lydia, who has nine children, and she goes out every Wednesday to the Walmart parking lot and lays hands on the sick, and she gets people saved. Every Wednesday, nine children. She has no excuse. There are many of you that are supposed to be going with her. It's over in Duluth. Is it Duluth? Norcross. In Norcross. Off of Jimmy Carter. But I'm telling you, she's looking for people. Nobody told her to do this. The Lord told her to do this. Hook up with her. I, I don't think there's anybody else in this room who has nine children, small children. She'll take them out there with her and pray for the sick in the Walmart parking lot. Do you know nobody's ever stopped them? Isn't that amazing? But I'm telling you what, y'all, let's do this. Let's go tell. Let's go into all the world and preach the gospel. You know what? You get them saved. Get them here and we'll disciple them. That's what Love You is all about, is discipling people. So then they can go and tell. And we're going to see this place grow exponentially. Exponentially. We'll talk about that next week in our candlelight service. Y'all, I'm telling you, I don't know about you, but that pierced my heart and ministered to me. I can't think of a better service we could have had today, Audrey. I can't think of a better service. So let's give her our best. Let's give the Lord our best to this servant of God. Let's give the Lord our best. And you know what? And when you sow... Yes, expect to harvest. What farmer goes out and plants a crop and doesn't expect to harvest? It's not selfish to expect to harvest. The Lord said to do so. So expect the harvest, but let's sow big time. Amen? Van's going to tell you how. All right. If you're writing a check, make sure you make it out to the Solid Rock of Atlanta. You're not writing it to Audrey. You're not writing it to anybody else. You're writing it to this church. So that the very end, before she gets on that airplane, we can, the church can write her a check of everything that's come in today. So you write your check to the Solid Rock of Atlanta. It's on the template in front of me. <clears throat> in the four column, put Go Tell Ministries Incorporated. And that's it. If you do it, if you, if you need it, if you're given cash, raise your hands and get an envelope. If you want a record kept of that cash, what you will do there is the same exact thing. You're going to be taking your envelope, circle where it says offering on there, and out to the side, write, Go Tell Ministries, Inc. Okay? If you go into our website, thesolidrockofatlanta.org, .org, and you'll look, go to giving. You'll see where it says giving. Click, click on a couple twig clicks. It'll take you to giving. And on there you will see a thing that says tithes slash offering. Then you'll see several more little things. Look for Go 
tell ministries there's only like three or four on there but it says go tell ministries and select that one and then give whatever you're planning the lord will have you give on that and then we will like i said we will before she gets on the plane today we'll give a check that's, that uh, is accumulative of all that for the full amount every penny that comes in for guest speakers we give every penny and have for 25 years so anybody else still need an envelope all right go ahead and uh, fill out your checks uh, and uh, do the envelopes whatever you're doing or go online we'll give you just a couple minutes and <clears throat> you're free to then whenever you have your your envelopes filled out and your your money put in it or your checks you can just bring them down here down front we have ushers down here that will take those things right here from you right now whenever you're ready and don't, then don't forget you can do it online also if you're watching on live stream you can do it online just go to the solid rock of atlanta dot org and then uh, go where it says giving and then follow the prompts and you'll look go down the drop down menu and it says go tell ministries and you can give that way Hallelujah. And while they're doing that, we never want to end a service without making sure everybody knows Jesus as their Savior. Y'all, that is the most important decision you will ever make, is to make Jesus the Lord of your life. So we just want to make sure, don't leave here today without that. So we have our prayer ministers down here, so you can come down and you can, you can let them pray with you to receive salvation also the baptism of the holy spirit is where the power is you want the power and you want the anointing and you want the boldness man you get filled with the holy ghost and you will be bold there is a certain boldness that comes with being filled with the holy ghost i'm telling you it makes all the difference in the world and so we encourage you if you have not been filled with the baptism of the holy spirit or you have not received jesus as your lord and savior please come down let our prayer ministers pray with you or if you're watching online we encourage you to, uh, if you're watching online, we encourage you to call us at 404-697-5215. Again, that's 404-697-5215. And we can pray with you for either of those to be saved or to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, Y'all, this has been awesome. Again, we encourage you to come back for Healing School. And I guarantee you, you'll be blessed for that. So healing school will start at 2 o'clock. We can release you right now if you want to go ahead and go run, grab something to eat. I encourage you, even if you want to go grab something at one of the you know places around here, uh, Dairy Queen or McDonald's or whatever it is. Uh, there's plenty, there's several numerous places out on, on uh, Shambly Tucker out here that you can go to to grab something and bring it back here. And you can go into our fellowship hall. Uh, where we have our Christmas decorations up and you can eat your uh, food and take advantage of that time right then and they'd be ready because we are going to start right at 2 o'clock for healing school. So thank you very much and uh, love all those around you and you're dismissed.